The American Homebrewers Association, which turns 40 this year, is offering a free book with every membership gift card purchase made during November and December. Head over to homebrewersassociation.org to see the free book options and learn more about the benefits of AHA membership. Spoiler, the books are awesome and the benefits are abundant. Head over to homebrewersassociation.org to see for yourself. That's homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 6th. 2018, I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Casey Helwig and Jess Caudill from Imperial Organic Yeast join us to help evaluate my Loki yeast fermentation temperature experiment. What difference will we detect between 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20C and 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32C? If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear, including our tie-dye silicone pint and our brewing rainbow shirt. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you do us a favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment, that'll help new listeners to find us, or at least that's what they tell us. And if you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks to everybody who's done so. If you go to basic or patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff you can access if you sign up as a, a supporter, including uh, bonus content that I posted this past Monday. Uh, I did a video episode on the experiment that we talk about on this very episode including video of the brewing process, and uh, I posted an early release of that, a uh, bonus behind-the-scenes video as well, and the recipe on the Patreon page, so go check that out. We've uh, got a bunch of disaster stories for our annual disaster show that we're going to record on Monday the 10th. Uh, Thanks to everybody who has sent those in. Always entertaining to read those. There have been, uh, you know... Some some mentions of of splatterings and ceiling ceiling splashes and stuff. <laughs> so uh, no serious injuries that I recall. Uh, I started a new batch of uh, makoli a couple of days ago. I'm hoping it will be ready for uh, when Steve and I get together at uh, Steve's brew shop to record. Uh, I want to do some holiday flavoring with this batch. Um, Also, on the Mockley front, the batch that I fermented with the wheat beer yeast that, you know, we thought was a bit too hot and too alcoholic is apparently mellowing with time. Either that or I'm just adjusting my taste buds to uh, like it more as time goes on. Uh, Also, uh, both batches of Mockley that I brewed have gotten a little more tart, even in the fridge. Uh, And there's a little hiss when I open the PET bottle. So there's something going on in there. I'm glad I've... (laughs) Glad I've kept them refrigerated. Uh, but uh, neither batch will be around much longer to worry about, though. By the way, um, on the Makali front as well, I finally figured out how to do sushi rice well in the Instant Pot. I used the rice function instead of, <laughs> instead of the normal high-pressure function. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize that the rice function was set to a lower temperature and a lower pressure, so... Who knew? Well, I should have known. I know. I've cooked rice before in the Instant Pot using the rice function uh, when I did my um, Instant Pot rice pilsner. uh, But I I didn't remember that it was lower lower pressure and lower temperature. Anyway, uh, I only cooked it for uh, four minutes under pressure instead of the eight that uh, it, it usually recommends on the rice function. So I wanted the rice to be a little al dente. Uh, when I took it out, like Tommy suggested in our Mockley episode. Uh, The fermentation is going crazy on this batch, so I guess that was the right combination. Uh, I got got tired of cleaning out the airlock when I (laughs) – this time when I had the air – I had an airlock in the lid. So I went back to ditching the lid and the airlock, and now I've got a paper towel and a rubber band covering the top. And uh, hopefully it will make cleanup a little less stressful. 
Hey, holiday gatherings are going on right now, and uh, our sponsor, Poncho of Poncho's Brewing Lab, he says he's putting the 20-gallon water cooler, uh, that is uh, the basis of Poncho's keg cooler, it's on sale for 125 bucks until the end of the year. So, uh, and also, if you, if you, uh, on top of that, if you use the code BBR at ponchosbrewinglab.com, that's P-A-N-C-H-O-S brewinglab.com, you'll get an additional 15% off. So y- y- you've, hear, you've heard me talk about Poncho's keg cooler. It is the 20-gallon water cooler that you can get with a built-in tap that's designed to, specifically to house a 5-gallon corny keg. But you can also use the cooler as a huge mash tun. You know, say you want to do a 10-gallon big old batch of beer, uh, and you still use coolers for your mash tuns, get one of these. It's You know, it's twice as big as your 10-gallon cooler. And Poncho says he's uh, designed the keg cooler as an alternative to jockey boxes, you know, which which can be a pain to work with, I take it. Poncho's keg coolers are, are great outside in the summer, as we've talked about, but they're just as great inside in the wetter. Your your big beer keg stays cold in the cooler, in that keg cooler with ice there around the keg. Uh, you know, while you're inside in the warm rec room or the hunting lodge or the fire going or wherever you're having a gathering. Uh, Poncho's keg cooler now has a stainless steel retractable intertap faucet. And the Keg Cooler Pro comes with a Sankey tap, so the cooler can be used with a sextal or quarter barrel Sankey kegs in addition to homebrew cornies. And you can customize your Poncho's Keg Cooler at ponchosbrewinglab.com. And don't forget about that $125 deal on the water cooler itself until the end of the year. And don't forget to use BBR to save 15% additionally on ponchosbrewinglab.com. Let's take a look into the mailbag. Dustin writes, I'm listening to the Ricky the Mead Maker episode right now, and you mentioned the no-boil method. I love this idea because of the massive time savings. I have a thought, and I want to break this down with you. What if you add the hops with the water at the beginning? Add the extract, bring it to 200, then chill without the 30-minute hop stand in the end. So doing a kind of a hop stand in the beginning there. Dustin says, I I suppose if it only takes 15 minutes to get it up to the temp, you could wait an additional 15 to get the hop character you're after. I think I'm going to have to try this. Well, Dustin, I hope you do. I I say, why not? Uh, You know, in the early days in the podcast, way back in time, there was a worry that adding hops to plain water would lead to grassy off flavors. However, in our first, our very first small batch experiment in December of 2005, we didn't find that to be the case. So, you know, pre-hopping the water as you're bringing it up to temperature should add some hop character, I would assume. Probably less at lower temperatures and more as the word approaches boiling, but still, uh, I think I'd, 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 you know, I might still do an abbreviated hop stand at the end, (laughs) just to be safe. But maybe it's not necessary. But it, it sounds like a good excuse to do uh, an experiment. And let us know if you do try that technique, Dustin. Let's talk about our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. You know, High Gravity is a full-service homebrew shop in addition to being a manufacturer of awesome electric brewing gear. And if you go to highgravitybrew.com, you'll see uh, featured a couple of tasty ingredient kits. First of all, Ichabod Pumpkin Ale is inspired by Tulsa Brewing Company's Old Pumpkin Head. Unfortunately, that brew pub is no longer around, but they say the memory of that beer lingers, and you can brew it yourself with that kit. Also, you see on HighGravityBrew.com, Love Potion Scottish Ale, mm, which was brewed by Baird Brewing Company in celebration of a wedding. Boy, that'll warm you up on a cold winter's night. High Gravity's kits are customizable, so you can choose extract or all grain, which yeast you want. And uh, some kits come with the option of adding additional ingredients to kick them up a notch. And as usual, when you're on HighGravityBrew.com, check out all the electric brewing system configurations with their Warthog controllers. That'll take the pain out of propane in your brewing. And if you use the code EBC75BB, 
you can save 75 bucks off your electric gear purchase. That's all happening at HighGravityBrew.com. Now let's talk to Casey and Jess about Loki, a fun Gweich strain that is happy at a wide range of temperatures. Well, Casey Helwig and Jess Caudle, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you. Now, uh, you guys, I, I brewed with uh, the Loki yeast, and I did an experiment. We're going to talk about that. Uh, but first of all, uh, Jess, you were, you were the technical guy. Talk to me about, uh, about this yeast strain. Can you, can you give some, some kind of background what, what it is and, and uh, what we're supposed to do with it? Yeah, it's it's a Kvike yeast, and the supposed origin is is Voss. Um, it's it's a really interesting strain. Um, when we brought it in, we we passed it off to a couple of breweries to to mess around with it and talk to them about running some pretty high fermentation temperatures up in the in the nineties, which they were kind of surprised to hear um, that high of temperature for fermentation. But um, we ran some test brews with them and got some really interesting results, some um, amazingly clean beers with this yeast strain. Hmm. So amazingly clean, is that, is that, uh, is that how you would, uh, uh, you know, what applications do you see, uh, you know, styles of beer that would lend itself to that? Yeah, it's, it's turned out to be a strain that um, people are trying a lot of different things with anywhere from um, almost lager-like beers to IPAs to double IPAs, um, and then also used with spices and fruits, just kind of a lot of different applications. Yeah, and Casey, you said, you, you told me, uh, which it kind of expi- inspired this experiment that, you know, you can do like pseudo lagers, you know, all the way up to fermenting at these these really high temperatures. It's, it seems like a really... Uh, versatile yeast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I think uh, for the most part, people are using them in hoppy beers. Just the the ester profile lends itself nicely to uh, to hops. But like Jess said, um, lager beer, lager type beers, all the way up to double IPAs, um, farmhouse sour beers, uh, fruited beers, um, super super versatile. And so would you compare it to, say, like a California ale yeast or something like that? I mean, you know, usually people go to like the Chico strain or, or US05 or, you know, whatever the whatever the numbers. Uh, and forgive me, I can't remember what the name of yours is, <laughs> although, I, although I've used it. But, uh, but you know, they go for the California ale yeast strain. Uh, it, would this be something comparable? I would say... If you're talking about the lower end of the range, if you're fermenting in the low to mid 60s, you might see some similarities. But that strain always, to me, has a pretty signature flavor, and the flavors that are produced with this strain are are different. But once you start going up into the high temps, into the 80s and 90s, then there's a there's a big departure. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And what what is your your California ale yeast strain? Uh, it's AO seven flagship. Okay, all right. I've used that. I, I've used more juice, I think, than I've used flagship. But uh, uh, and so so, what's the advantage of, of fermenting at higher temperatures? Um, I guess one of the advantages is just the fast fermentation rate. So if all other things are equal, um, cranking out a fermentation at ninety. You know, you could have completion in a couple days. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, using those high temps, you can, with this strain and other Kvike strains, produce some aromatics that are are pretty awesome. Now, I I looked at, uh, if if we want a detailed uh, description of what Kvike is and and the applications thereof, uh, I want to refer people to the wiki at uh, the Milk the Funk, uh, you know, they have an extensive uh, page on that. Um, but kind of give us some, give us the 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 general overview of Kvike. What what is this stuff? Everybody's talking about it. it seems like. Yeah, it's. I mean, my understanding is 
you know, these are yeast strains that have been isolated from Norwegian farmhouse beers. Um, you know, I think traditionally these beers were produced on, you know, at people's homes and on small scale, and they maintain their own yeast strains from batch to batch, year to year, you know, generation to generation. And they they are mixed cultures, right? Yeah, I, you know, considering that they may be originally from spontaneous fermentations, I'd I would think that most of them are going to be mixed cultures. Yeah, and that the method for storage was uh, traditionally done on a, a wooden ring um, uh, with like linked together. Um, uh, rings and so the the yeast would just dry in the little cra- crevices and crannies of the uh, of the ring and so definitely lends itself to a lot of mixed culture. Mm-hmm. And that would include, uh, you know, maybe lactobacillus and and other organisms mm-hmm. other than yeast as well. For sure. And another uh, resource I want to mention is is Lars blog, uh, which is maintained by. Uh, uh, brewer and author Lars Marius Garshol as well. Uh, so uh, this uh, I got uh, sent to me, uh, which I've talked about many times on this uh, show, um, a sample of the Simonitis yeast, which is not really a kvike, uh, but it is a farmhouse yeast from uh, Lithuania. Uh, and it was sent to me by a listener, uh, Frederick in Denmark. And he said that he he got his samples uh, from somebody else who probably got their sample from somebody else. And so, <laughs> you know, the, in in this form, uh, it's it may be kind of an evolving product, right? If you get if you get it from your friend who's a home brewer who also got you know his from another friend who was a home brewer, uh, in a similar fashion, you know, that these probably traveled from farmhouse to farmhouse in their native lands. You know, it's it may be different. Uh, from brewer to brewer. Yeah, and I, uh-huh. yeah, totally. I think that that's definitely the case. And even once they get over here in the States, they're bouncing around to different people. So it's not always, uh, ne- you're never sure where that actually came from. But the Loki is not a mixed culture, right? It, it's just yeast. It's a single sacrifice. Single sacrifice. Which uh, you know, as as a as a commercial yeast producer, uh, it gets more tricky to do. <laughs> I would imagine more tricky to do uh, mixed cultures. Yeah, we do a few um, mixes, but we typically grow them all up separately, and then at the very end of packaging, we'll we'll blend them together before they go into the package. So, what goes into uh, making uh, a, a an amount of yeast? that's ready to distribute, you know, to the, to the public. I mean, how do you, how do you grow up a small sample as a commercial, you know, yeast manufacturer? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it's similar to what homebrewers are doing to make starters, but we're, you know, starting at a smaller level and ending up in a larger place. But typically every week here, we're, we're making anywhere from 10 to 20 different strains and, each one of those strains starts off on a production slant, which is just a, a auger material in a vial, and it has a film of yeast on it from a single colony that we grew up. And from there, it's going into a 15 mil tube of our growth media, and then up to about 500 mils. And then from there, it can go into production into a tank and and go anywhere from about four barrels to 30 barrels Hmm. of of growth media. And once the yeast is done growing, we'll typically um, crash the tank and uh, harvest and homogenize the yeast slurry. And then we start running QC on on all of that. So we'll do microbiological QC, we'll do some PCR, and we'll also – do some cell counts and viability to figure out exactly how much yeast we have. And so is the growth medium, is it, is it hopped or is it, is it just, you know, what is it that you're using? We're using a dry malt extract based media. So it's uh, you know, we're a certified organic producer. So 
the ingredients that we have to work with are somewhat limited, but the majority of what goes into our growth media is organic dry malt extract. And I would imagine that you – do you add, say, more oxygen in the process than you would in, say, brewing a batch of beer? Yeah, definitely. That's where everything kind of departs from your normal brewing. Um, once the media is produced and in the tank, the yeast is inoculated, and then it gets continuous aeration until it's done growing. Now, the the fun thing about this is salmonitis yeast that uh, that I got – uh, or alleged Simonitis yeast, you know. <laughs> we don't know the provenance, as they say in the uh, you know the fine art world. Uh, but uh, I I brewed a batch of beer with it and only hopped in the mash, and then stuck it out on my front porch when it was ninety degrees Fahrenheit or thirty two C outside, um, and I got a nicely tart uh, beer out of it that I really like a lot. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, that indicates to me that probably this was a mixed culture as well and that there's probably some lactobacillus in there uh, that is um, active uh, and is very happy at those at those warmer temperatures. Uh, isn't, isn't that what you would suspect as well? Yeah, if, if your beer was noticeably tart, um, I'm guessing that came from some lactobacillus. And if you're using a really low hop rate, then that might allow the lacto lactobacillus to actually do something. So we I did another another experiment uh, with the Loki, uh, and uh, are, are you guys ready to get into that? I'm ready. Sure. <laughs> I'm thirsty. <laughs> Very nervous. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what I did was I, I brewed a 10-gallon batch of beer, which which I hardly ever brew a 10-gallon batch of beer uh, because I'm the only beer drinker in the house. Or You know, my wife does drink beer, but considerably less than I do. Uh, so uh, what I did was I, I took uh, – for this 10-gallon batch of beer, I did 10 pounds or 4.5 kilograms of German Pilsner malt. Uh, and then after the mash, I did the, the – just like a mash for a regular 5-gallon batch – I added in six pounds or 2.7 kilograms of Pilsen light dry extract along with five more gallons of uh, water. And uh, I brought that up to a boil and added two ounces or 56 grams of UK Fuggle uh, for 60 minutes. And that's all the, that's all the hopping. Uh, and mm-hmm. I did a partial mash because I've got a brew in a bag system. And, uh, you know, the older I get, the the less I want to lift up like 20 pounds of wet grain. <laughs> so <laughs> so Steve Wilkes suggested I do a partial mash, and that worked out well. Uh, so the original gravity is 1048, the final gravity 1010 on each of the samples. Oh, by the way, uh, I chilled the wort down to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32C and then pulled off half of the wort into a carboy, stirring as I did so that I'd get a uniform amount of trube uh, in each carboy. Mm-hmm. And then I chilled mm-hmm. further down to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, or I think that's 20 C, uh, mm-hmm. and then and then pulled off the rest of it, uh, and I pitched a, a packet of uh, A43 Loki in each of them. I put uh, the 68-degree one down in the basement, and then I uh, cleaned out my brewing system from high gravity, my electric brewing system, and I put water uh, in there and put the carboy uh, for the 90-degree sample in there uh, and essentially used the, the electric system as a sous vide at 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to keep the wort uh, at a constant temperature while it fermented. And I tell you, you know, usually— That was very clever, by the way. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I, uh, I I love that system. It's very flexible. Um, but I, I tell you, you know, usually I'm very impressed with how quickly uh, a pitch from you guys uh, at Imperial uh, starts up and goes. But uh, at 90 degrees, this yeast was very happy very quickly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, keep a timer on, a timer on it or anything. But, but just like three hours after I pitched, I came back and the airlock was was, you know, bubbling, uh, you know, at a fairly regular basis. And then at about midnight, my, you know, my eyes opened, 
And I said, I better go check on that downstairs. And I, I did. And it was it was about to come out of the carboy. So I put some uh, firm cap S in there just mm-hmm. to calm it down. Uh, and then the next day, uh, about, you know, 24 hours after pitching, I had to do the same thing with the, the one at 68 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So, you know, very active, happy yeast. Uh, and after three days... Uh, the 90 degree fermentation one was done, um, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and and I took it out of the out of the uh, system and put it in the the uh, guest bathroom to be, uh, you know, to condition or to, you know, to flocculate out. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, I collected samples. Uh, I kegged most of it, but I also did some some uh, bottle condition uh, examples uh, of which I sent uh, some bottles to y'all. And Steve Wilkes and I also uh, tasted the samples as well. And uh, let's let's go back in time to when Steve and I uh, tasted these two samples. Well, Steve Wilkes, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. Just seems like moments uh, <laughs> <laughs> since we were here. It was a mere cleanup ago. <laughs> the table's still sticky. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have in front of us uh, two beers. And I will have uh, described the recipe and the process to uh, our friends at uh, Imperial, if all goes as planned. So what you have here is a 68-degree beer and a 90-degree beer. So let's first talk about the 68-degree the beer. Okay. Um, well, it tastes very good. It, what I'm really struck with is the there's kind of a, a graininess to these beers in other words um i think that the yeast really brings a lot to the party this loki does and and what it does is it accentuates the grain profile of the beer for me so and i like that in a beer that's that's desirable to me i I like to taste the grain and i feel like i'm i'm getting that in in this beer quite a bit just for your uh, education and satisfaction, they, they, this is all Pilsner malt, or, or it's half Pilsner malt and half uh, uh, dry malt extract. Oh. Uh, and then we, I hopped it. This is a 10-gallon batch. I hopped it with uh, at 60 minutes with two ounces of Fuggle. Okay, well, so, so yeah. So, so, it's, so it's, it's meant to be a beer that shows off the, the uh, yeast. And, it, and I think it does that very well. It's very pleasant. Um, yeah, so the hops, just to get those out of the way, are nice, and uh, they're not dominant like uh, an American IPA would be a hop-dominant beer. This is not. Um, but there's just a nice little floral, hoppy back, backbone to it. But, uh, but yeah, it definitely shows off the, uh, the grain profile of the beer, I think. And I think it's distinctive. This is not the first... Uh, beers I've had with this strain or its close relatives, and I get that the same characteristic from the other beers I've had with this yeast. It's to me, it's um, the sixty-eight degree one is sort of uh, it's got kind of a dark, funky edge to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it there's there's um, a bit of yeast character, you know, like you actually I, I actually feel like I'm tasting yeast. I do too. Yeah, even though it's fairly fairly clear it's flocculated you know fairly well uh, I still get there's kind of a yeastiness uh, or breadiness uh, to it uh, it's really interesting um, you know and it makes me wonder if I had added a little bit of coriander a little bit of spice or something like that it would have been nice actually when you said breadiness the first thing that my mental palate went to was like a slice of french bread it it really does go there that that much to me. It it would be excellently paired with, you know, some kind of a French a baguette kind of a sandwich or something like that, or you know, the little toast points. You know, with some cheese would be great with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um it's nice. It's a nice, easy drinking, interesting uh, beer that's not. You know, this recipe, if you were to do it with, like, you know, a California ale yeast, it would be kind of plain and not much there. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that the yeast 
definitely brings a lot to the table it, it, with this. And that's kind of why I was talking about the hops a minute ago, that that hops aren't playing a big role in this. Even the grain's not really. It's just that I think that the yeast shows the grain off pretty well. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's right. let's skip, skip over. Let's ramp up the temperature some. And this spent some time at uh, uh, three days at 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the high-gravity uh, electric brew in a bag system and kind of a sous vide treatment. So we'll, we'll take a sip of the 90 degree. To me, it's brighter. There's um, more of a fruity, although it's not like overly fruity, uh, there is a brightness to it. Um, and in that way, it tastes kind of more clean than the first one. Does that make any sense? It does, although uh, the brightness that I get is it goes a little bit to a lemon hmm. for me. So it, it, I don't mean to say it's citrusy like putting in citra hops. I just mean that there's a little... So I think that that's that brightness note that you're calling bright. Hmm. I'm calling a little bit of a, of a lemon characteristic. And then I also picked up just a little bit of kind of a phenolic character. Hmm. Very slight, um, not really off-putting. If it was much stronger, it would be off-putting, and I would attribute that to the temperature, I would assume. But um, this beer, to me, goes more toward one... Of course, it, it said at 90 degrees, but this would be one that you'd want to sour, really sour, hmm. I think. Um, and so... But it, it's very pleasant. I will say that I think I like the 68 better. Huh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to split with you on that. I, I think I like the 90 better. I like it's... It, like at the, it, it's it's brighter, yeah. Uh, you know, it's more. It is a little teeny bit more citrusy, uh, and that. And I don't think there's a lactic component because I think if there was, lact, you know, some sort of lactic acid producing uh, bacteria in here, it would have gone crazy in three days at ninety degrees. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think we'd have a really sour beer. Yeah. Um. But uh, but I I I, I like them both. Uh, even though the recipe is fairly plain, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I, I do like the the brightness, uh, you know, that the that the yeast brought to it at ninety degrees. Um, yeah, I don't dislike it. I but I like the the sixty eight degree one. I think has a little bit more mouthfeel. It's just a little slightly more luscious. It's maybe not the right word, but it's just it just has a little bit more body in the beer to me. And and again, I I really like the way it, it the breadiness and the doughiness of that of the sixty eight is very pleasant to me. And then the brightness and the the a little bit thinner finish in the higher the ninety degree beer. Um, again, it, I'm not I'm not criticizing it as in it's bad, you know. But I just I do prefer the sixty eight degree one. Yeah, interesting. I think your perceptions are are right on. I think it's just a matter of of uh, preference oh, between, between us, yeah. you know. And on a different day, I might I might pick out the <laughs> the other one because, yeah. like I said, they're both they're both tasty. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's what's so kind of so much fun about the hobby, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. every beer is a little different, every fermentation is a little different, and you can have the exact same ingredients and just treat them ever so slightly differently, and you get a different beer. I wonder what this will do. Yeah. <laughs> will it <laughs> brew? <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, James. So there you go. To recap, uh, the 68-degree one, Steve and I thought was tasted more kind of grainy. Uh, Steve said it had kind of a floral, hoppy backbone with kind of a funky edge to it. Uh, the yeast character was bready. Steve said it kind of uh, reminded him of French bread. Uh, and he thought it the beer had more body uh, than the ninety. The ninety degree one you know, we thought was was brighter. Uh, as Steve said it had a kind of a lemony-ish character, uh, more clean, and he said it was very slightly phenolic, but in a good way. I like the ninety degree one better. He liked the sixty eight degree one better. Uh, so uh, nervously, uh, I ask y'all. You've got samples there in front of you, but uh, what what were your impressions? Um, the sixty eight when I when I just uh, 
took a sniff on it, it, you know, if nobody told me what I was checking, I would have thought like a light American lager. It had this really, really light, crisp, almost sulfur note to it. Mm. Um, really clean, clean nose. And the flavor, um, you know, I'm getting a lot of character from that Pilsner malt used. So really nice, balanced malt profile that's really driven by that base malt. And the finish was pretty clean. But with this, I wouldn't maybe go as far as saying tart, but just crisp character that's probably from a little higher acid production by the yeast. And Casey, what did you think of the the lower temperature? Uh, I'm yeah, I'm like nodding my head with Jess as he was describing that. Um, I I definitely get a really clean um, fermentation profile. Uh, I pick up on a little bit of that sulfur note as well. Um, nice graininess from the uh, the Pilsner malt, uh, and then body wise, it's just it's light, it's crisp, um, very very reminiscent of a an American light lager. Um, it, finishes really clean really crisp um kind of dry which is nice um and i don't i don't get a lot in the way of ester profile um other than that just slight uh sulfur edge to it Hmm. and jess what do you think about the hotter one um i thought there was some pretty significant differences between that and the other one uh i still get the really light hint of sulfur um not not detracting from the beer, but, um, you know, I'm picking that up on, on the aroma, but then when I taste it, the flavor is way different. I'm getting like dried orange peel. Uh, I'm getting a little bit, I don't know what, why, but I'm thinking almost like a black licorice mm. flavor in there. Um, and then the finish is, I guess a little more dominated by some, uh, I wouldn't, like borderline astringent character. So it's not the same crisp, almost tart finish. It's a little bit different finish in the beer. And Casey? Um, I actually get a whole lot more tartness out of the finish of this beer than the, uh, than the one fermented at 68. Um, uh, as far as aroma goes, I get a lot of like uh, citrus esters, um, you know, lemon, orange, um, uh, a little bit of like, candied grapefruit almost um there's a there's a sweet edge to it as far as as my palate goes um in the uh in the body um a little bit of a stone fruit almost peach like uh uh aroma um but finish it's kind of nice and bright and and almost tart for me hmm. yeah i i i I can go along with with all of that. I, <laughs> of course, it's cheating, uh, but uh, I think that the the um, the sixty eight degree one kind of reminds me more. Uh, Jess, you said like a like a lager. Uh, mm-hmm. To me, it also reminds me kind of like an English ale kind of thing, um, where it's more kind of malt driven. Uh, than the 91. The 91, I would like to see what happens in like a Belgian, like a big, Bel- you know, Belgian golden ale uh, mm-hmm. yeah. with some, you know, some sugar and, you know, high gravity. Um, mm-hmm. Have Have you had some examples of, of different uh, gravity levels brewed with this string? I'm trying to think if I've had any higher ones, but I think mostly what we've had has been in the five to probably seven and a half range. Mm-hmm. Um, but I agree with you after tasting that high temp fermentation sample, I think it could lend itself to a like a triple style or something like that. I almost think that it'd be a nice, uh, a nice strain to use for a wit beer. I think the ester profile would, would blend nicely with a little bit of coriander. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's al- a good idea. And also some, some nice uh, citrusy and, and grapefruity or, uh, you know, mango uh, hops, you know, like a like mm-hmm. a nice hop stand beer uh, would go as, as well. Um, it's it's fun. The you know, anytime anytime we do an experiment and we didn't do like a triangle test, you know, where, you know, we pick out the odd sample to, to make sure that what we're tasting is is, you know, uh, is not influenced by our, 
you know, by our minds. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, but but it is fun to taste these side by side um, and to kind of, you know, exercise our palates and, and figure out what's what's different between the two. Yeah, that's always fascinating, no matter how many times I make beers side by side like that. So, yep. So, it is, what happens to Loki? Does it go back in the stable? <laughs> uh, it'll go back in the stable for uh, for the winter months. I'm a, I'm guessing. <laughs> um, it's it's a uh, seasonal for us, so available October November of this year. So, people have a few more days um, to buy it up, uh, and then it'll go back in the stable until uh, until next year. So do, you said that you you've you've made you know you can make mixed cultures. Uh, is there are there any plans to do like a like a mixed culture seasonal release? You know, mixing up different uh, uh, Kvik strains, you know, with different characteristics, kind of to kind of mimic, you know, what what goes on when you trade from farmhouse to farmhouse. Yeah, I think. Um, I, yeah, I think that'd be interesting. Um, we recently collabed on a brew out at Everybody's Brewing, and we did the brew at Lanakai Brewing also. And he brought in a indigenous uh, lactobacillus strain that we grew up here. And then we had a friend up in Seattle, uh, Sean from Slight Beer Labs, who had a few different Kavik strains in his bank. And he sent us three strains down that we grew up, and we brewed a beer over at everybody's with, with these cultures. And, um, it was really interesting fermentation. We took the, the Hawaiian lacto and soured the wort in the fermenter down to about 3.3. Mm-hmm. And then, then we pitched the, the yeast blend in there. So we did the souring around 100 to 105. And then we dropped the temp to 95 and pitched the yeast and, and let it rip. And, uh, there are just some amazing, uh, flavors and aromas coming out of that mix. Wow. So so if Loki is going into the stable, are there, what other, what else is coming out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we have uh, about 15 different Kavik strains um, that we've brought in-house recently. And so uh, they're going through the banking process right now. Um, and it's our hope to release maybe a blend uh, next summer. As a seasonal, um, I really like the idea of three or four different Kavik strains um, packaged in the same packet, uh, so people can really get that that mixed culture, um, almost more traditional uh, representation of the Kavik. And then, what other seasonals do you have coming out? Uh, in January, we're going to be releasing. Um, a, uh, a big Belgian strain. Um, it's actually yet to be named. Um, you can you can tell we're super creative here at Imperial. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you know, winter time people are brewing big beers. A lot of times they're Belgian inspired, and so this beer or this strain is uh, uh, super suitable for for big high gravity um, Belgian inspired beers. Does it have a number yet? Uh, B60 is its number. B60. So, mm-hmm. so, so if they want to send you uh, suggestions for a, for a big Belgian yeast strain, they, <laughs> they can send them to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Send them on in. We'd love to hear the name suggestions. <laughs> Not all names will be used. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great because, uh, I've been wanting to, I've been itching to do like a big, you know, Belgian golden ale uh, here recently. Uh, you know, like like I need those calories here uh, to you know put onto what I, what I'm doing to myself uh, during the holiday season here. Well, you got to keep warm <laughs> somehow, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, this is this has been fun. Anything else? Uh, anything else for the? Did we miss anything on on uh, Loki or or Kvik that uh, that you want to talk about? Um, I think well, there's been some interesting talk about using these Kvik strains at really low pitch rates. Um, so I think that'd be an interesting thing for 
for people to play with is um, checking out what it may do when it's actually under pitch compared to what you would normally do. Um, driving a lot of the, the ester production and making some some more flavorful beers. Yeah, that would that's a. Uh... That's one question that I was going to ask. You know, y'all are famous for your high high amounts of you know yeast cells in a packet. Uh, you know, I guess uh, I guess if people want to, um, you know, either reserve a little bit for a, for another batch, or you know, if they want to, you know, do a split batch, uh, you know, and and maybe split a packet between you know a couple of carboys or something like that. You know, this may mm-hmm. be a good opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I think- I think that's reasonable. We're usually we usually cringe when people talk about under pitching, but I think uh, there's been quite a few people getting some good results, especially when they're cranking up the the fermentation temperature. But along with under pitching, brewers might want to consider upping their nutrients a little bit, and hmm. um, that might help the fermentation finish out better. There you go. Sounds like another round of experiments. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, awesome. I, I appreciate your uh, – uh, I can't let you get away without uh, saying that I appreciate your continuing support uh, of the of the podcast. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy the product and, and look forward to, to what you all are coming out with next. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for yeah. chatting with us. Yeah, thanks for having us, James. Well, thanks again to Casey and Jess of Imperial Organic Yeast. And, of course, thanks to Steve Wilkes of Steve's Brew Shop. You can probably find Loki if you hurry and ask your local homebrew shop. I know Steve still had a couple of packs when I was at the the shop a couple days ago. Looking forward to playing with other Kvike strains as they come out. Also, join that Milk the Funk group on Facebook for tons of funky fermentation info. And you can ask the experts there if you have questions about brewing sour or funky beers. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions for me, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies are coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Drain, All Grain, not All Drain. That's a bad, that's a brewing disaster. Low-tech lagering and decoction mashing and introduction to wine kits. You can find them all on our site. You can get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. And you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too, including our new Brewing Rainbow shirts. You can find our log books where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. I just filled one of mine up. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com and take a look at our silicone pints while you're there, too. It's all till next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website's provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs>